before I pray and we begin today, just a couple of notes. One, it is uh, thank you for your prayers, and it is good to be back safely from Israel. It was an excellent mission visit and mission time in Israel, and certainly a great joy to uh, preach in the oldest Protestant church in the entire Middle East, Christ Church in Jerusalem, last Sunday morning, last Sunday evening, and then uh, to share Shabbat services uh, with the Jewish Messianic believers in uh, Tel Aviv, Yafo, Friday night before coming back. But we are happy and grateful to be back. You know, as you may know, certainly this past week things intensified uh, pretty badly between Islamic Jihad as well as Hamas and Israel. And uh, Nancy and I were, whatever you want to call it, uh, able to see lots of fireworks. Um, including from actually the heights of uh, Azeka, which overlooks the, the valley where uh, David killed Goliath. And it was interesting to see that was the second day of Israel trying out its new uh, defense system that's actually called David's sling. So it was interesting to be, be atop the area where David killed uh, Goliath in part with a sling uh, and a stone as well as Goliath's own sword. And to think about that as we we're watching things being intercepted and blowing up overhead. So it's good to be back. Thank you for your prayers. Also, uh, since it's Mother's Day and just thinking about this, and I talked with Carl about this before I did preach in Jerusalem at Christ Church, but they follow the Revised Common Lectionary and the gospel passage was from John chapter 14, uh, verses one through 14. And this is where Jesus talks about not to let your hearts be troubled, trust in God, trust also in him. In my Father's house are many rooms or many places for you. I go to prepare a place for you. And it was just so interesting. I was on the plane reading that passage and starting to link it to the other passages they had for the common lectionary from Acts chapter 7 and, and, and Psalm 31 and just thinking about Paula and that Jesus had just, you know, fulfilled that passage for Paula a wonderful Christian mother and a wonderful sister in the faith. And then to think about, I'd be sharing that good news on Sunday uh, with uh, folks from all over the world, as well as certainly the Messianic believers in Jerusalem at Christ Church. We had people from the Netherlands, Germany, uh, the Middle East, Asia, uh, all, Africa, all over the place in that packed Sunday morning service, as well as the Sunday night service. So great. Great to be there and great to be back. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, all our mothers. We love you. Jesus loves you. You're going to hear that again in a minute. And uh, for all of our sisters in the faith, uh, welcome. And let's prepare to turn to God's word. Let's pray together. Father, as we come before you today, we again give thanks for our sisters in the faith and as well as my brothers in the faith. May you speak to us all by your word of life that we might truly live in you and that we might truly have, just as we sang, Christian homes where you rule and you bless and you save. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Before we turn to today's scripture, I want to open with an introduction. Uh, the name of the sermon today is Invite Jesus into Your Home. And here's an introduction. I have good news for you today. It's Mother's Day, so I want to start with something very nice at the beginning. Jesus loves women and brings the good news of his kingdom to women. That's actually really important good news. And he brings his good news to women, and that includes, guess who? Moms, as well as, now I'm gonna push you to the edge now here, some of you are gonna be challenged by this, even mothers-in-law. Mothers and mothers-in-law. Jesus loves mothers and mothers-in-law. Jesus loves all women. The, the Bible tells us from the beginning that God creates us male and female in God's image. Male and female in God's image. That's Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. And John chapter 3, verse 16, one of the more famous verses of all the Bible. Most of you know it. I hope your children know this one by now. 
Um, we'll return to John 3.16 in a few minutes, but for God so loved the world that he gave his monogenes, his, his only begotten, his one and only son, so that whoever, notice it doesn't say so that whatever man believes in him, it says so that whoever, that means men and women, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That's good news, isn't it great? God loves women. Jesus loves women. Jesus came to minister to women. But now I need to turn to something else. It's, it's an old southern proverb, I guess you would call it. And it goes like this. When mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Have y'all, probably some of you have heard that one before. Or you could say, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Now, let me ask you this. Do you think that's godly wisdom? Or is that just kind of resigned and sometimes sarcastic humor of fallen people living in fallen families. Well, you can kind of ruminate on that for a few minutes. Here's the gospel truth. The gospel truth. I love you moms. I am so blessed to see you here today. I'm so excited to be back from Israel and to see some uh, American moms among us today. Thank you for being here. And also international moms too. God bless you. But here's the, here's the reality check. Here's the cold shower. Mama is not actually the center of the universe. Mama is not the center of the universe. Let's go a little bit deeper now. Mama is not meant to have universal authority over the entire cosmos or even over one little house and what that would be a microcosm of the universe, right? A house, a family. Mama is not actually even meant to have authority over one little husband or even one little child, even her youngest child, even her baby. So, the reality is this. When mama presumes to take anywhere near universal authority, even over her own family, things are gonna turn out really bad. And what she thinks was gonna be good because she's getting her way is actually gonna be slavery to sin, destruction, and death. It's just not gonna be good. It's been that way ever since Eve wasn't happy. You may remember this story. Eve was not going to be happy until she could take the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, I don't know. I wasn't there, so I can't clarify to you. If, uh, but some of you might think this, that the Garden of Eden was in the south and that Adam was a good southern boy. You know, been raised by a good southern boy. Well, it's, and, and that maybe for, for all I know, there was country and western music blaring all over the Garden of Eden, talking about it, when mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. I don't know. But I do know this. At the crucible of the fruit, his problem seems to be, among other things, that Adam caved to the notion that if Eve wasn't going to be happy, nobody's going to be happy, so let Eve get her way. Thank God for his grace, though. I got some more good news for you. You and I do not need to be stuck forever in the choices of Eve and Adam in the garden. Isn't that great? We don't have to be bound into that family anymore. We don't have to belong to the family, ultimately, of Adam and Eve. Yes, we have to deal with mortality, death, and fallenness in this world, but that's brief. Because on this side of God's call of another woman named Mary, and on this side of God's bringing about the virgin conception, the seed of the woman, on this side of Christmas and Christ coming as our Redeemer, we can be part of his household, not Adam and Eve's. And, and moms and dads and children can find real joy in seeking not first and foremost mama's happiness, but pleasing Jesus. What a concept. What a different direction. <laughs> uh, the real joy is Jesus' joy and pleasing Jesus. And you know what, Mom? You're going to be more free, more healed, and more joyous if it's not about you, but it's about him. And if what happens to your children is not about you, but what he wants. 
That's the gospel. Jesus loved women and brought the good news of his kingdom to women. And mama is happy when she and her household rejoice in Jesus. So that's my call and my invitation to you today as we prepare to turn to God's scripture. Uh, we're going to be turning to the Gospel of Luke. For those of you who aren't normally with us, we're working our way through the Gospel of Luke right now in this church with our sermon work and sermon proclamation. Uh, so we're not in John chapter 14 like I was last week in Jerusalem, but we're, we're in Luke. And we're turning the page back a little bit to where we've been the last few weeks as we've progressed through Luke. Remember, I kind of made a placeholder for you a few weeks ago. And I said when we were closing out Luke chapter 4, we were going to reserve two, three verses and come back to them. Now go, go ahead and read a few more verses that we've already read before, not dig too deeply into them. But the key verses are going to be uh, verses 38 and 39 of Luke chapter 4. And then we're going to read through uh, verse 41 as well. So here now, God's word. This is Luke chapter 4, verses 38 through 41. And he, this is Jesus, arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he, Jesus, stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now, when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them, each one of them, and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God. But he, Jesus, rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Messiah, the Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. So I have some radical good news for you from 2,000 years ago, and it's what I've already said, that Jesus loved women and brought the gospel, the message, the word of the good news of his reign, of his kingdom, specifically and personally to women. Now, you would say, well, yeah, that's obvious, Pastor. You know, we, we, we assume that. No, 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 you have to understand this. In the ancient world, that was highly radical. Jesus is equally bringing his gospel to women as well as to men. And, and not only that, he's calling women who truly believe in him to become his followers, just like he's calling men to be his followers. He's calling women to be, broadly speaking, his disciples, not his apostles, but his disciples. Now, that was basically unheard of 2,000 years ago. Uh, let me ask you this. If you know anything about, um, you know, high-level philosophy, uh, the, pretty much the template for Western modern thought, how many women, how many female disciples exactly did Plato have? Can you name them for me? Zero. What about Aristotle? We all love Aristotle, right? No, 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 no. Aristotle said men are basically form and women are matter. The, the, the form, the thought needs to shape. <laughs> women are lower level. They're obviously not going to be disciples. The, the rabbis of Jesus' day, any other rabbi in first century Palestine, how many women disciples did, you know, just name, name them all, just kind of put them together. I'll give, you, I'll give you 500 rabbis. How many women disciples do we come up with with the top 500 rabbis of the first century in Palestine? How many? Zero. But Jesus has women disciples. Uh, are you hearing what I'm saying now? Um, and, and Jesus, we, we know these. This isn't just pastor kind of reading between the lines here. We, we know some of these specifically by name. Jesus had some high-class women disciples, I mean high-level women, like Mary and Martha of Bethany. 
who had a brother named Lazarus. These were high-class Jewish people, really sophisticated Jewish people, who had a really nice spread in Bethany right outside of Jerusalem. It's where Jesus typically stayed when he was in Jerusalem for a high holy feast. These are high-level women, but not just these high-level women, not just like Martha and Mary of Bethany. We know that Jesus had many disciples as women who were formerly women that nobody would have gotten close to, that, that nice women would have been afraid of, not, not to mention men, like women who were possessed by demons and women who were, you know, seemingly compromised in the society. So let me just, we'll come back to this later, but Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, and, and it came about soon afterwards that he, Jesus, began going about from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus is always doing, preaching the kingdom of God. And the 12, that means the 12 apostles, the inner core group of disciples, they were with him, and also some women. Well, what kind of women? Women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons, and count them, <laughs> seven demons. Jesus had delivered her from seven demons. And Joanna, the wife of Husa, Herod's steward. This, is, this guy's working for the retro, you know, reprobate named Herod Antipas, and his wife is now a disciple of Jesus, and Jesus is allowing her to be. But, but any good, like, zealous political Jew wouldn't want to be associated with her. But she's a disciple, too. Let's just keep going. Um, Susanna and many others who were contributing to their support out of their private means. So these women were not only disciples, they were key givers to Jesus' ministry. They're stewards, they're tithers, I mean, they're givers to the, to the ministry. And this group includes moms. And this group includes, yes, I know Martin is pushing you a little bit here, mothers-in-law too. M mothers-in-law are even among these disciples. And how do I know specifically that Jesus loves mother-in-laws? Because we just read it. He heals Simon's mother-in-law, the first woman named that Jesus heals in Luke's gospel is not just a woman, but she is a mother-in-law. How do you like that? We read this in Luke chapter 4, verse 38 and 39. We read it in Matthew chapter 8, verses 14 and 15. Mark chapter 1, verse 29 through 31. Let's remember what's happening. We've already been introduced to this. I'm Rewinding the tape a little bit to what I preached on a few weeks ago. Luke chapter 4, we have kingdoms in conflict. We have the ruler of this age and the ruler of the kingdoms of this world. His name is the devil or Satan. And we have the son of God, the true king, Jesus. We open Luke chapter 4 with the temptation and the conflict and the testing between the ruler of this age, the devil, and Jesus, who brings in eternal heavenly kingdom to us, you know, in the, in the desert, the duel in the desert. Here's what we have to understand. Spiritual conflict is real. It was real 2,000 years ago. It perhaps arguably is even more real in our highly sophisticated, digitized 21st century. And spiritual warfare does not just apply to palaces, nations, major powers, the White House. Spiritual conflict applies to your house too. Let me repeat that. Not just the Kremlin, not just the White House, but your house too. So we need a savior for our house. We need a Lord for our family. So that's how you fill in that blank in the, in the notes if you're following along with the, with the notes. Spiritual warfare for individuals, for communities and nations, but also for households and families. Now let's go back to John 3.16. For God so loved the world. The Greek there is cosmon. It's cosmos. It means like all the world and all creation. But you know more Greek than you think you do. 
You know, I always tell you guys this, right? So, Greek, for little, micros. You know that word, right? Micros and big cosmos, but you put little with cosmos and you get microcosm. And what is the microcosm of human society? It's not the big nation. Let's go a lot smaller. What's the microcosm of human society? And what's the microcosm that generates children who grow up to be adults? The home, the family. So God not only so loved the entire cosmos that he sent his one and only son, he also loved your home so much, your microcosm that you're involved with, your family, that he sent his one and only son, that whoever believes in him, he's sending Jesus to redeem your family too. So the essential microcosmos, microcosm for people and for society is family. Now, a lot, of, a lot of forces in this age working against families. You may not know that. There are a lot of forces. I mean, in fact, official forces working against your family. But Jesus is sent to save your family and your household, no matter what. No matter what the government does, no matter what, you know, intellectuals do, no matter what the coastal elites are saying, I'm telling you. And Jesus says this, behold, this is Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. He's talking to the church, but he's also talking to your household. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, anybody, anybody in there hear my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. In other words, we're going to commune together. We're going to be family together. Uh, let me tell you this. I'll keep coming back to this. If you invite Jesus into your home, though, he's the boss. He's the Lord of the household. But I want to challenge you to invite Jesus into your home. Now, some of you are going to tell me, well, look, I've made a profession of faith that Jesus at church at a, or, or, or at a teenage rally or when I was at college or this or that, and I got baptized this or that time. I'm already good with Jesus. What about your home? What about your heart? What about the way you, if you're a parent, parent your children or your grandchildren? For real. Sold out totally to Jesus or sold out to the world? Whose word dominates, your word or Jesus' word? I want to invite Jesus into my home. I want to invite you to do the same. Jesus preaches the gospel of God's reign, Luke chapter 4 and following. With what? What did we see in Luke 4? It's a Greek word, exousia, with authority. Jesus preaches the gospel of God's reign, of God's kingdom, Luke keeps telling this over and over again, and the people are saying this, with authority. By his word and by his deed, his follow-up, his, his miracles, his healing, his driving out of demons. Jesus preaches the gospel with authority. He preached the gospel of God's reign with authority, not only publicly, but now we get it. In Luke 4, 38 and 39, in the home too. So we're back to this dynamic. It's, it's one thing to come to church and say Jesus is Lord. It's another thing in the way you live outside of a couple hours at church. And Jesus comes into the home with authority to preach and to act on the gospel of the kingdom. And he does this specifically for the first time we see this when he goes to Simon's house and heals Simon's mother-in-law. Jesus healed, we see this over and over again, same verbs keep getting repeated, by rebuking destructive powers and doing what? Releasing people. This is what he says when he quotes Isaiah 61. This, this word, this Greek term, aphasis, to release, is used over and over again. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has sent me to do what? Pronounce good news to the poor, release to the captives, to set at release, to free, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Over and over again, we get this aphasis language, and this is the way he works, and he does that in homes too. So Jesus arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now, we've got it up here for you. This is the first time Luke is mentioning Simon, period, in his entire gospel. But he assumes Theophilus, to whom he's writing, knows who Simon is. I mean, Simon, Simon's no. Okay, Simon's a big leader in the church. And he assumes that everybody reading this is going to pick up on who this is. 
he's kind of holding Simon to the side. I preached on this a couple weeks ago until we get to chapter 5. But, but here he goes ahead and says, he goes to Simon's house. Who is Simon? Well, Simon is also known as Cephas, that's the Aramaic for rock. So if you were listening to Jesus talk to Simon 2,000 years ago, he'd be referring to Simon all the time as Kepha or Cephas. That, that's Jesus' heart language, that's Aramaic, that's the way they talk day to day, okay? In, in church, Hebrew, regular language, Aramaic, but also Peter, right? Jesus is nicknamed for Simon. He's the rock. Let's go to a little bit more information on Simon. He is also, uh, he's also being developed already as a new disciple. I mentioned this to you a couple weeks ago. The way I read all these Gospels together is we have the initial connection with when Andrew, Simon's brother, is a disciple of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God. Andrew grabs Simon to come meet Jesus because they found the Messiah. Then later, when you read in Matthew and Mark, they're starting to kind of be part-time disciples, and Jesus is calling them along the shore to drop their nets and follow him. But they're on the shore. What Luke focuses it on is next stage in Luke chapter 5, when Jesus takes Simon all the way out into the deep, and we have the miraculous catch of fish. And for the first time ever, we have a disciple, Simon Peter, who confesses sin before Jesus and confesses Jesus as Lord. This story is before we get to that third, third level, okay? We're in the second level. He's kind of a disciple. Jesus is hanging out with Simon. And Jesus, um, let me tell you one other thing about Simon. He's married, okay? He's married. Paul refers to this. Simon's married. Um, Clement of Alexandria uh, tells us in the early church that Simon Peter's wife worked with Simon in ministry and specifically ministry to women. Okay, Paul tells us he's married, 1 Corinthians 9, 5. So he's married, and sure enough, that's consistent with this story. So Jesus, um, he leaves the synagogue. The way the synagogue schedule worked is it's Shabbat, it's Saturday. You have church starting, synagogue starting at the third hour by Jewish time, it's nine o'clock. You worship in the synagogue for about two and a half hours, and getting close to the sixth hour noon, you're gonna go home to have lunch. Lunch is already cooked, you don't cook it on the Sabbath, but it needs to be served. So around noon, after close to three hours of worship in the synagogue, and Jesus casting out a demon that possessed a man <laughs> as a highlight of that worship day, Jesus is going over for lunch. This is a day in the life of Jesus, right? A synagogue day, it's a Sabbath day. So Jesus arises and, and enters Simon's house. Now, I have a couple pictures for you. This is Capernaum. Uh, you see that white thing that says synagogue? That's the uh, second century, third century edifice above the basalt, a synagogue below, which is from Jesus' time. The dark thing below, the smaller ones. Okay, and you see where it says church above Peter's house? You see how close that is? That's less than 40 yards away. It's literally a stone's throw from, from where Jesus has been in the synagogue casting out the demon and teaching and all this kind of thing. So he's going to go um, for lunch. He's going to walk basically a few steps to Simon's house. Now, let's go to the next slide. This next slide shows you, you see the smallest edifice inside a couple other, you know, borders? Okay, that's actually Simon's house. We pretty much know that because of all the artifacts and the graffiti from dating back all the way to the first century. That's identified as Simon's house in Capernaum. The thing outside of it is a um, uh, second century house church that was built as believers in the, in the region would come there to worship and gather. The largest thing on the outside, that's a Byzantine level church that was built at the time of Constantine and Helena around the original house. But the point is, there's the house. You can see the house. Now, you know, just remember how small this house is. You see the thing in the inside? That's the house. Simon is actually from Bethsaida, but he's moved to Capernaum as his base, and Jesus is using Simon's house as his base in Capernaum for mission and ministry. So that's Simon. Here comes Jesus, and obviously Simon has uh, invited Jesus into his house for lunch. Who's going to have lunch with you today? So Jesus shows up. Now this is really interesting. 
Jesus rejected somebody's request for miracles at the beginning of what we read in Luke chapter 4. Whose request for miracles did he reject? The devil's. Turn, turn the stone into bread. Serve yourself. Glorify yourself. Jesus rejects the, uh, the Satan's, you know, appeal and also rejects the idea that he's here to serve himself and glorify himself. But when people in Simon's house start asking about the mother-in-law, Jesus has a heart for that immediately. Jesus is very interesting. It kind of depends who asks him and for what. It's a big deal. So Jesus responds. He stands over Simon's mother-in-law. And when he stands over, it's the same term we saw in the miracle of the catch of fish when Simon refers to Jesus as epistate. Here it's epistasis. It's, it's Jesus stands over. He's the master. Do, do you hear what I'm saying? He's the boss. He has authority over that house, and he has authority over that fever, and he stands over her. Mark and Matthew tell us he's going to pick her up, take her by the hand also, but Luke really wants us to get the exousia here, the, the kingdom authority. So Jesus stands as the authority of the house and rebukes the fever. It's a high fever, Luke tells us. The other guys just say fever. Luke tells us it's a high fever, and she's released. And immediately she rose and began to do what? Serve. And, and the term there is like the term for deacon. Okay? She's serving. She, she's table serving for the Shabbat meal. Um, let me say this. We'll come back to this with the Sabbath healings. Um, the tradition and the, the rabbinic teaching is you're not supposed to heal somebody and a doctor's not supposed to heal somebody unless they're in, in jeopardy of dying on the Sabbath. You need to wait otherwise. But that's not actually in the law. And Jesus clearly is just going to fulfill and follow the law, not all the rabbinic tradition. So he goes ahead and heals mama. I mean, right then. And then she gets up and serves. Now, let me just tell you, when I was in Jerusalem, the, the evening service, I had a guy come up to me. Um, he's a recent believer in Jesus, and he's from a Haredim family. And he's not just from a Haredim family. He's from the like, high-level rabbinic people, okay? a high-level rabbinic family. All his dad and his uncles are all highest level of rabbis in the Haredim, in the Hasidic community in Jerusalem. But this guy now believes that Jesus is the Messiah. He came up to me, thanked me for my exposition of the Torah and the, and the New Testament and the message of Jesus. But then some of the people from Christ Church and the mission to the Jewish people talked to me afterwards and said, we need to really pray for him because he, he, he believes in Jesus as the Messiah, but he doesn't get following Jesus because he's been raised as royalty and he doesn't know what it is to be humble and to serve. Because in his world, everybody serves him. Now he's been renounced by his own family, but he still doesn't understand about serving and being humble. And here's the thing about being with Jesus, is nobody is royalty, but everybody's royalty. But in Jesus' house, royalty serves. Jesus washes his disciples' feet. It's just the way it works. So we need to pray for him and other people like him, maybe not just Jewish background, but other people too. Um, and, of course, the reading between the lines here, I talked about this when we dealt with this passage in Mark. Uh, it's not in the Bible, but I have to, okay, this is Martin now, this is not in the Bible. But you have to guess, I infer, that Simon's mother-in-law would not have been excited that he's becoming a disciple of this crazy new rabbi because he had a good living going, being a fisherman, and all of a sudden this rabbi is going to mess everything up for her daughter and the family. But isn't it an interesting appointment that she gets the high fever and Jesus heals her, and now all of a sudden she's on board as a disciple too, serving Jesus? You think that's by accident? No. But it does involve commitment and cost. It involves serving. And let's just go on to what happens. So in this little bitty house, everybody remember the little bitty house, right? As sundown comes, so that the people don't have to be afraid of being persecuted because they're seeking healing on Shabbat. When the sun starts going down, that means the Sabbath is over. 
they start coming in droves to be healed by Jesus. And in this little house, you just got to picture this. They're all lined up. <laughs> there's, a, there's a line in Capernaum, probably all the way out to the seashore. And all these people all night. I mean, who knows how many? It says it goes on like all night. They're coming in and one by one in your house, mama. <laughs> Jesus, because you have accepted him as Lord, your house is now a mission field. You don't get to have everything nice. It's not just like, well, let's have the doilies for Shabbat lunch and this. Thing. It's all of a sudden, it is a mission house. There are costs and commitments to inviting Jesus to be Lord of your house. People, demons crying out, you know, you're the son of God and Jesus rebuking them. It must have been a kind of a conflicted healing session all night in her house. But I think she's okay with it because Jesus just saved her, right? So here's the bottom line. Someone's word rules every family and every house. Whose word is heard and honored in your house? Moms, dads, single folks. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone inside, including mom, hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with her, or eat with him, and she and he with me. Invite Jesus into your home. Invite Jesus into where you really live. Invite Jesus into where your family lives. And he will revolutionize. He will heal where you, can only, you couldn't even imagine. Is it going to be easy? No, it's going to cost a lot. Is it going to be awesome? Yes. Because all of a sudden, you and your family belong to Jesus now and forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.